I think the beauty and the wonder for me personally about Hebrews is the fact that Paul is sitting down or he's actually I don't know if he's sitting down or not to be honest <laughs> who knows but he's taking the time to write down specifically to the Jew what it is that Paul knows about Jesus. Paul is writing and explaining to a Jewish audience the very fact of God from a traditional Orthodox Jewish perspective and bringing them into the realization of the Moshiach as he has presented himself to Paul and explained to him not only by demonstration of power from on high when God knocked Paul off his horse but also the very presence of God as Paul described that there was a man he did not know whether in the body or out that ascended into the heavens and spoke with Jesus and so in that we see in Hebrews Paul finally getting that what he always wanted which was to be able to speak to his brethren and to lay these cards on the table as it were to lay it all out there to present the most concise precise theological treaties that any Jew could ever write it is the halachot of the actual Mashiach being presented to a Jewish audience in a Jewish way for people to know such a deal oh. And we treat it as though it were the least of some of Paul's writings. Oh well, maybe you got to be Jewish. <laughs> That's why we call it the explanation. Because we want to explain why it is so in-depth and so deep and so meaningful and so relevant to us, not only today, but to every single consternation that you have from every theological premise and idea and ideology that's out there when there is such a cultic mindset of all these different peoples that are coming at you. Guess what? Jews did it first. <laughs> Already had that idea. We tried this, we tried that, we went here, we went there. Believe me, when it comes to Talmudic reasoning, when it comes to the Orthodox mindset, when you look into the Jewish writings, the Kabbalistic, the Tanya, when you go to Chabad, when you go to Orthodoxy, when you go to Reform, no matter what mindset there is of the Jew in the rabbinical literature, it is far short, far less, and every Jew knows when they read it, the book of Hebrews proves its point. It doesn't mean they accept it. A Jew is a Jew. Such a deal. A Jew cannot deny coming into contact with the living God. He will not. When God Almighty reveals himself, a Jew will accept God. But a Jew also can recognize when a point is made and it is fulfilled. Very good in logic, very presentation, very accurate in presentation and logistics when it comes to laying out and presenting in a logical format the reality of what the point is being made. And Paul does that in Hebrews. He proves law. He proves grace. He proves beyond any shadow of a doubt what Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what Jesus has accomplished for you and I. Hebrews 1 2, we read. In way of review, God spoke in the old days. He spoke to his prophets. Yeah, such a deal. He spoke to donkeys. Good thing. Who would have listened? He spoke to many different times. Sometimes not so soon, sometimes so far apart. He spoke in ways that he chose to do, not we. He has spoken. And notice that it says he spoke doesn't say he wrote, it says he spoke in diverse manners. And that's in verse 1. And it says that he spoke unto our fathers, the fathers of the faith of the Jewish nation, to Abraham, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Yaakov, to Israel, to Klal Israel, to the people of God who were listening, who heard, who had within their heart the yid 
to respond that would flare at the very knowledge of God and flame into the personification of what God would do in the hearts and minds of his own people. Should they listen? Should they hear? Should they know? But in verse 2 he says, but in these last days, in these last days, which is our days, which is this day, which is the day you live in, for we know and we proved and we shared in verse 2 when we were talking about it in the last day, about how the latter days had begun back when Herzl first to proclaim that there would be a Jewish nation. I see a nation. It shall be birthed and we will call it Israel and it will have the Mog and David and it shall be with the song that we sing if I forget the old Jerusalem. It shall be Hatikva. It is our hope. We shall go into the land and we shall proclaim it ours. And we will return as a people and a nation who were not but are. And we determined that from that moment on, the latter days had begun. For surely it had to have begun at the turn of the century because you could line out everything in the scriptures and you could see how, wow, just like in Nehemiah, just like in Ezra, just like in the proclamation that went forth to rebuild the temple, so too Herschel said, we're going to rebuild the nation. And he went and they built the nation. And 120 years later, they declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel forever and it was reunited. So we know we're in the last days based upon verse 2, knowing that Jesus has spoken unto us through his Son. He has given us the Moshiach, the Messiah, the Son of Man, who has come as a suffering servant and died and rose again and became unto us salvation, who is to become the salvation of the nation, but who for us has become a personal salvation intimate and real, a knowledge of God Almighty, whom our fathers have known, and now we have been made available to. And so in verse 3, Paul begins to describe who Jesus is. Who is this Son of God? Who is the Son who has spoken in diverse times and manners in the past? Who was there when all the worlds were made? And every Jew knows that there's worlds, not the world, but worlds. And we know by Jewish tradition, by Jewish explanation, we know by the rabbis, we know by the sages, that the worlds were including those that were unseen and those that were seen. The worlds is what Paul, by way of being a Pharisee of Pharisees, likewise identified all of creation being contained in the word worlds and so we see in verse 3 in reading who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high <sighs> Boy, the majesty on high. Christians don't talk like that. Such a deal. Jews do. Who is this majesty on high? Is he not the Almighty, the unutterable name, the one whom we have known was the yud heh vav -Hey? from creation, from before when our fathers first told us that we would become a nation, that we would become a people chosen by him, that we should be, that they would be my generation, my people, I would make of them, and they would follow me, and I would use them to be a light unto all the nations, and out of them would come the light of the world. And so it is, who being the brightness of his glory, behold, the light of the nations has come. The light who would come out of the people Israel to light up the world who claimed and came and said, I am the light. I am the halachot. I am emet. I am Yudhavah. Behold, in verse 3, he's making a statement that the Jew knows exactly what he's saying. 
who being the brightness of his glory. What is the brightness of his glory? It is a Jewish expression. It is the Shehekiyahu, the brightness of his glory, the glory of God that came down from heaven, that shone upon the temple. That was the very presence of God. That was the glory of God revealed. Who being the very brightness of his glory, who when we saw that there was that glory upon the tabernacle, that emanation of light that could only be from the presence of God Almighty, who being the brightness of his glory is that person, the Son, and being the express image of his person, who is the brightness of his glory, the Shehekinanu, who is the image of his person, can God be a person? The image of God Almighty, whom we know God has said that he has appeared as an image, as a reality in our personality that we have seen come out in the shining forth of Moses as his face was veiled because of the glory that shone from within. He had to be covered because of that brightness of his glory and the express image of who? His person. That is the sun. What is the sun? As the Christian says, and we know, such a deal. He is the way, the truth, the light. And they say the light is the way. Well, no big deal. But we know that tradition teaches us, ah, the light. Mm. As the light was cast forth and the farther the distance in such creation was created and at the farthest distance was the evil one and the closest distance was the sun. Do we read Tanya? Do we know Tamu? Are we Hasidic? Are we Chabad? What are we? Or are we just sages seeking after the truth, the way, and the life, knowing that Paul himself was well aware of the traditions of our fathers? And he knew what he was saying when he said, being the brightness of his glory. For have we not seen, and have we not heard, and have we not been told? How in the book of Revelation, it is unfolded for us, the full revelation of what God the Son looks like. The image of his person, as Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The image of his person, the image of God is revealed in the very personage of the Son of Man, the Son of God. As the Moshiach is, as we know, has been described by the Law and the Prophets to be the very essence of God himself. And the rabbis have told us that God would come into the Moshiach to make it as God. But did the rabbis understand? Could he have been the Shehekiyanu? And we see that the debate went back and forth. That they said, oh, but he could not be God. He would have to be as God. No, but if he was as God, then he would be God. So what can it be? Can there be more than God, infinite as he is, that we do not understand that he could be the express image of God? That the only way to see the Father would be to see the Son, even as Jesus said, is that a presentation that the Jews have already made? Yes, because Paul likewise states it here. And he didn't just get it of himself. <laughs> Genius that Paul is. No, the rabbis had said so. They had discussed this. They had been a question. How can this be? And so they had wrestled with it and discussed it and decided. So Paul identifies it. Yes, you were right. You have found the image of God. God has manifested himself in his son. He has revealed himself as the image of himself in his son. When you see the son, you have seen the father. Jesus said, have I been so long with you and you do not know me? If you have seen the father, you have seen. If you see me, you've seen the father. And upholding all things, upholding as even God himself said, he holds all things in his hands. So how does he uphold them? By the word of his power. Where did the expression of word of his power come from? Is it some kind of Christian terminology that the Pentecostals use by saying that if we know the word, then we can just speak it into existence and it happens? Or did we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse, I believe it's 10, maybe it's 
11, where it says God spoke, but it didn't say it existed. It says God created after he spoke. It didn't say that he spoke it into existence. Where you see, it's not the word that makes something exist because God speaks in heaven and it doesn't just exist out of nowhere or come from bara, but rather it comes when God determines its right timing and its right place and he puts it into existence. God creates. He doesn't create by saying and speaking. When he speaks, things happen. Such a deal. But God can speak without there being something happening. And such as it is, the word of his power is when he chooses to speak by his authority, his ability, his sovereignty. The word of his power is that expression that discussed the almighty who was what? The majesty on high. As we know, as we have heard, as we've been told, as we have sat at the feet of the rabbis and discussed it and heard from our sages who have said the majesty on high has the word of his power. But who is this word of his power? Who upholding all things by the word of his power? Who is the one upholding all things by the word of his power? Is it not his son? Is it not being stated so obvious and true, so real and so perfect in the spirit of Moshiach, as we have heard of the Shehekiyah, that the spirit of Moshiach has gone into the world? The spirit of Messiah holds all things together. The spirit of God Almighty. Moshiach would have the spirit of God overflowing from himself that he would give the Spirit of God without measure. Do we not know these words from our own rabbis as well as from Christian sources? When he had made himself, we know that all things by the word of his power, upholding all things, who being the brightness of his glory, he expressed image of his person, when it starts off in verse 3 and it says, who it is connected to the Son. For in verse 2, we know that it connects to who it is in verse 3, and that is the Son. So then, being the Son, who is the express image of his person, who we know is identified already in verse 3 as being the image of God Almighty. When he had by himself purged our sins. <gasps> Boy, who can purge sin? Who can take away our sins? Who can remove them far from us? None but God. For God is the one who tells us we are sinners. But God is the one only who can remove our sins. So how has he removed our sins? How could the Son take away our sins? How can this image of his person who upholds all things by his word of his power, who is the brightness of his glory, take away from us our sin? Because we, we are sinful. He purged it. <sighs> purged. For we have made covering for our sins. We have been under the cloud. We have sprinkled as it were, and poured the blood of lambs and goats and bullocks. We have done as God has commanded us by the law, and we have covered our sin as mighty as many as it's been. But who could purge them? Who could purge us and remove the need for their being to have to have a covering, but purge us from that sinfulness, that sin completeness of doing it over and over and over and over again for we sin we were born in sin we were conceived in sin and we'll die in sin but who can save us from our sins Hoshana, Hoshana, save us now O God, save us now Hosanna only Moshiach only Messiah and he had by himself purged our sins. It is a fate accompli. Fate accompli. It is a accomplished fact. It is something that is 
done. It is accomplished. It is finished. For he has said, he purged our sins. Sat down. He purged it and he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Who but the Son of God could sit in the presence of the majesty on high? Who knows? Who knows? How dare we say there'd be anything less than what Paul is saying in verse 1, 2, and 3. How dare we identify that there'd be any other reason that Paul is writing this except to reveal who and what Jesus is to the Jew. For surely he has purged us from our sins. He has uphold all things by the word of his power. He has been the image of who? God? Who else? He's the image, the express image, the very personification of a person contained within that which he created. A body thou would not desire, but a sacrifice thou didst not desire, but a body thou hast prepared for me. You have prepared, O oh God, a body, a vessel that I could inhabit, so that I could accomplish the purging of sin by making that by myself be that which would remove the continual process of sin in those who have need of being forgiven and he had need of being removed from their capability of continually sinning for otherwise they would have to continually offer sacrifices over and over and over and over and over that never seem to cleanse anything but always are being presented over and over. Yes, we know to remind us, to remember, to observe, to always be mindful of the fact that yes, we sinners and now we're forgiven, so go and sin no more. But purging our sins and removing them, taking it from us, accomplishing it, and then sit it down, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Behold the power of God Almighty and His Son, who is able to take away our sin, who is able to sit down, knowing it is done. For had there been anything else left to do, if there was one thing that Jesus still needed to do, he could not have sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He could not be seated at the right hand of the Father. He could not be where the Jew knows. He who is at the right hand is preferred above all others. For this is the man who has the honored seat. This is the man who has accomplished that which the majesty on high sent him out to do. This is he who is honored in heaven above all else. For he is seated at the right hand of the majesty of the yud heh of the Yehovah, of the I am that I am and I will be what I will be to my people I will be and I will be to them as I need to be to the one who is called the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the God of Yitzhak Yaakov and Avraham the God who has become the salvation to Gentiles the God who is seated as as is his rightful duty to be the right of the one seated at his right hand <laughs> or the left to be seated god almighty god Yehovah, the one we say that the bima the torah sits as a representation of a direct ladder connected directly to his throne to his majesty on high for we know that the angels ascend and descend directly to the torah and they come from the word and they go outward from there so when we present ourselves, we bow. And to the right hand of the Father, to the right hand of the Majesty on high, who is it that is seated there? Paul has declared and God has spoken. It is 
He who upholds all things by the word of his power. He who is the brightness of his glory. He who has become Messiah to the Gentiles, Moshiach to the Jew. He who is coming and shall come to the salvation of the nation, but who is presented as the salvation who purges sin from us, that we may approach the majesty on high and know God Almighty. In this, the explanation as Hebrews, as Jews, as those to whom God has chosen to reveal to the nations His plan of salvation, then we know that we know that God has proven Himself in His Word, and His Word declares who this man is. And we will see, as we read it, in this explanation of Hebrews, that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeshua is the Moshiach. Yahushua is our salvation. Joshua has become the Jesus of the Gentiles. For surely we know that this son of a carpenter, this son of man, though he were of lowly means, has become the salvation of the world. As we look at the word in Hebrews, as we study it as Jews, grafted in, not grafted in, rooted, not rooted, fruited, not fruited, branched, not branched, <laughs> twigs, not stock, whatever. <laughs> you figure out where you are. Who cares? But as we study as men, let us approach the reality of what we're talking about, of how holy how righteous and true these words are that are written to the Hebrews.